Good morning. Uh, this morning, uh, we're continuing our series of uh, considering different aspects of our union with Christ and their bearing on spiritual formation. And today, we're focusing on union with Christ, specifically identification with Christ. Quite frankly, for most of my Christian life, I've found this passage, Philippians 3, 1 through 14, to be an off-putting, intimidating text of Scripture. So I'm actually um, quite surprised and grateful to the Lord for what he's allowed me to come to see about this passage. And I'm hopeful about how it might speak to our community in which each and all of us are called to be ministers of Christ Jesus, ministers of the gospel. I want to begin by saying a few words uh, about the context of Philippians. Uh, as you know, Paul is writing this letter from prison. Uh, it's probably written in 62 AD, so it's uh, written in the final years of his life. And it's written to the church uh, with which he had the closest and warmest continuing relationship since they were the direct outgrowth of his ministry in that city. And they had consistently supported his work over and above, above any other church that he had uh, planted. This epistle is also well known for Paul's decidedly counterintuitive, repeated declarations that he rejoices precisely in the midst of hardship and great pressures. We know from chapter one that he's being confined in prison and as he does so, some people are stepping into the ministry vacuum. They're doing so selfishly and spitefully. They're using his absence as an occasion to stir up trouble for him, presumably spreading false and malicious rumors about the reason for his imprisonment. He's also facing an impending trial before the Roman tribunal, whose outcome could be that he could lose his life. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in a very striking passage in uh, Romans uh, 1, uh, in Philippians 1, uh, 20 and 21, uh, he repeatedly says that he rejoices. Um, so to move over to our passage uh, for this morning, strikingly, at the beginning of this passage, Paul again calls the Philippians to rejoice. Then he issues them a striking warning not to fall prey to the Judaizers. Uh, there are several notable pas parallels in this passage with the theological problem that Paul confronted at the outset of his ministry in his earliest letter to the Galatians. Galatians, as you know, was written, uh, it was probably the earliest epistle that he wrote, uh, probably about 48 AD, um, some uh, uh, 24 years uh, earlier. And there, Paul was forced to confront Judaizing thinking head on uh, in the form of outsiders pressuring those Gentile believers to undergo circumcision and to take on the yoke of Torah again. Paul, as you know, vehemently opposes it by stressing two pivotal truths that are directly related to our subject today, uh, the basis of our identity in Christ. So I'll just briefly uh, recount them uh, so that, we, that we're aware of that at, in the backdrop as we continue to attend to uh, this passage. Paul says in Galatians 2, 15 and 16, we who are Jews by birth know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And um, continuing on, he says, he um, articulates uh, the very basis of, uh, of Christian identity. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, uh, Paul establishes from the very beginning of his ministry, the Judaizers are dead wrong because Christ himself, Christ alone, uh, is righteous. He is the basis for our acceptability before God. To attempt to supplement Christ is to supplant Christ. It is to set aside the grace of God and to pervert the gospel, incurring divine wrath. So what Paul is actually addressing uh, from another perspective in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, is a matter of mistaken identity. Um, and he goes on to elaborate what union in Christ or baptism in Christ and uh, incorporation into Christ brings about. Uh, baptism or incorporation into Christ uh, not only uh, is the basis of our justification, but it is through the indwelling spirit, um, it is how we receive the, the Holy Spirit and are adopted uh, as God's sons and daughters, and become heirs grafted into the Abrahamic covenant and recipients of those blessings and promises. So as Paul puts it in a later letter, 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31, it is because of him, the Father, that you are in Christ Jesus, united to Christ Jesus, 
who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Christ is absolutely uh, the sole foundation uh, of our identity in Christ, of our, not only of our legal standing, uh, our pardon, our declaration of righteousness on the basis of his own righteousness, but uh, its union with him that all of the other blessings that we enjoy in life um, come through. John Calvin regarded union with Christ as of paramount importance. Uh, and uh, just to hear a little bit of what he has to say, he says, as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. As long as he remains outside of us and we are separated from him. Therefore, to share with us what he had received from the Father, he had to become ours and to dwell within us. All that he possesses is nothing to us, though, until we grow into one body with him. It's true that we obtain this by faith, yet not all people indiscriminately embrace that communion with Christ which is offered through the gospel. He also says, Therefore, that joining together of head and members, the indwelling of Christ in our hearts, in short, that mystical union, are accorded by us the highest degree of importance. The indwelling of Christ in our hearts, the mystical union, is accorded by us the highest degree of importance, so that Christ, having been made ours, makes us sharers with him in the gifts with which he's been endowed. We do not, therefore, contemplate himself outside ourselves from afar, because we put on Christ and we've been engrafted into his body. In short, because he deigns to make us one with him. And then lastly, uh, he says, Christ, uh, uh, when he illumines us into faith by the power of the Spirit, at the same time so engrafts us into his body that we become partakers of every good. He makes us engrafted into his body, participants not only in all his benefits, but also in himself. So we ought not to separate Christ from ourselves or ourselves from him. Rather, we ought to hold fast bravely with both hands to that fellowship by which he has bound himself to us. Christ is not outside of us, but dwells within us. Not only does he cleave to us, he cleaves to us by an indivisible bond of fellowship, but with a wonderful communion, day by day, he grows more and more into one body with us until he becomes completely one with us. Now, some 14 years later, uh, Paul still has to adamantly warn the Philippians, as we saw, to reject Judaizing teaching. However, the primary issue that Paul's addressing in, is different in Galatians. Here, the Philippians are operating with a common but faulty assumption about what it is to be united with Christ. Specifically, they harbor misconceptions about their own identity and relationship to Christ. What Paul writes in the chapters leading up to this section shows that he assumes the facticity of their union with Christ. In fact, he begins his direct exhortation to the Philippians by appealing to this reality. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. So he absolutely assumes the union, the objective uniting of the believers with Christ. That is not what is in question. But in what follows, it becomes evident that it's possible for Christians to be objectively united to Christ and yet existentially to be only partially identified with Christ. In other words, whereas Calvin rightly says that Christ cleaves to us with an indivisible bond, our own identification with Christ is not a foregone conclusion. It's not a fait accompli. Uh, to put it another way, it is one thing to be united with Christ it is another thing to completely identify with Christ in love. To repeat, it is one thing to be objectively united to Christ because of his action. He unites himself to us. Um, it is a different, although related matter, for us on our part to become completely identified with him in love. So union with Christ activates a process of personal transformation leading to a total self-identification with Christ in love. Paul's specific diagnosis of the, of the Philippians problem is most succinctly stated in chapter 2, verse 21. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. This is the condition that characterizes the community as a whole uh, in, earlier in the chapter. Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit. 
rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others, verses 3 and 4. This is why he dwells at length on Christ as the example par excellence of acting neither to protect or to promote his own interests, not holding on to his own prerogatives, but humbling himself to the utmost, becoming human and even further dying on the cross for others' benefit, verses 5 through 11. And in the section that immediately follows that, Paul commends first Timothy, I have no one like him who will show a genuine concern for your welfare, verse 20. And then Epaphroditus, uh, who almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to assist Paul, verse 30. So they resemble Christ. Uh, they are counterexamples of the default modus operandi that Paul identifies in 2.21. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So after emphatically condemning the Judaizers' claims in our passage in uh, verse uh, 2, Paul addresses this underlying problem, notably by spelling out the marks of distinctively Christian identity. First of all, he reminds the Philippians that it's not the Judaizers, but they, Christians, who are the true circumcision. In other words, uh, it's Christians who have received the new heart and spirit promised with the advent of the new covenant, who consequently have been given the capacity, the new capacity to love God uh, with all their heart, with the totality of their being. And this identity, he says, is in relationship to the Trinity. It is we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And so for the rest of the passage, he develops a profile of Christian identity and thematizes the latter two aspects. We boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So the first point that Paul fleshes out in verses 3 through 9 is what it is to identify with Christ. And he explains his own life in relationship to these two identity markers. We boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Then in verses 4 through 6, Paul lists seven personal attributes that are examples of the flesh. The first four pertain to ascriptive identity. They attach to factors not principally within one's own control, such as birth circumstances, family of origin, gender, etc. And uh, Bruce Molina and Jerome Nyre have described the uh, first century Mediterranean model of identity as dyadic, meaning that um, the identity of individuals in, in such a culture was seen as primarily and largely determined by genealogy, geography, generation, and gender. Uh, that, that was what was uh, esteemed and prized and most important in a culture like that. Um, that ends up being obviously very different from our own culture, and we'll look at that momentarily. But so Paul, the first traits that Paul uh, refers to as uh, a basis for, for boasting, for uh, putting confidence in, in himself, his background, um, are, uh, they have to do with his being circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So his ethnic ancestry and tribal lineage establish his natural descent and birthright citizenship in Israel, the people called and the nation constituted by Yahweh at Sinai. His proper circumcision indicates his rearing from infancy by devoted parents, and, and that adds further to an impeccable pedigree. In addition, however, beyond these accidents of birth and his family of origin, Paul's quite accomplished in his own right, which pertains to achieved identity, and that's what the next several characteristics are about. He is, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. He's highly educated. His theological commitments and uh, convictions and religious commitments, they're substantive, strict, and serious. So Paul cons uh, possesses considerable social assets and advantages conferred on him by his family circumstances and upbringing, and he acquired still more power, privileges, and notoriety uh, by his own exceptional accomplishments, including, apparently, distinguishing himself in advanced theological education under Gamaliel, um, Acts 22.3. So both with respect to ascribed and achieved identity traits, Paul was a standout, a fast-rising star, gaining a reputation as the one to watch. Uh, as he himself says in Galatians 1.14, he was advancing in Judaism beyond his peers. So in verses 7 through 9, it's striking that Paul asserts, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What Paul is doing is radically relativizing 
the value of the social status markers in his own culture. Not merely Judaism as a religious system, but meaningful distinctions operative within his own community in everyday life. For instance, um, that reference to uh, being of the tribe of Benjamin and the self-designation a Hebrew of Hebrews, certainly it uh, reinforces uh, his religious identity as an Israelite, but it would be cited to strengthen his claim to preeminence as belonging to the original inner circle, akin to claiming to be a descendant of the founding fathers or to having your ancestors arrive on the Mayflower. Um, so Paul categorically demotes the value of his social connections and professional achievements with respect to their function as status symbols. Attachment to his advantages and attainments as a validation of his existence and worth are no longer salient for his self-understanding, he says. And the scope of this outlook can't be restricted to Paul's pre-Christian Jewish past because he goes on to say, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. It applies even to his post-conversion Christian life. Uh, he says that regardless of the losses he has had in fact to relinquish in order to obey Christ, and in Galatians 6.14, he said that through the cross of Christ, he became dead to the world and the world dead to him. Uh, regardless of those losses, he has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. His actual experience of communion with Christ vastly outstrips what he has had and will have to lay down. In fact, we know Paul goes even further and says, I consider them, again, all of these advantages, all these matters of prestige and notoriety, I consider them, everything, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ, faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What does Paul mean when he says, I consider uh, them, everything that was a gain to him, garbage, uh, for instance, uh, his achievements and his reputation, which is being undermined and trashed by unscrupulous rivals while he's in de detained in prison. Um, I don't think he's referring to their objective on ontic value as such, uh, as if he were saying, for instance, that the positive fruit resulting from his ministry is in fact utterly worthless. That's not what he's saying here. Rather, Paul is renouncing. He's not merely curbing, but disavowing his emotional attachment to them, in that they so easily become a preoccupation and lead to self-absorption, which detracts from the full attention he wants to give to Christ and the full reliance that he wants to place in Christ. We boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What's most notable here is that Paul's self-conception has become drastically simplified, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, found in united to Christ, in union with Christ, having a righteousness which is through faith in Christ. Paul's declared aim, his ambition, is to be found in Christ, verse 8. And it indicates that he now desires not to be identified on any other basis, but ultimately to be known simply as in Christ, or Christ's. What Paul's self-understanding suggests is that now, at this late juncture in his life in ministry, he is fully in touch with the truth that the totality of his person and life rests upon Christ, rests upon grace. Paul is resting the weight and the significance of himself and his life solidly and solely upon God's grace, the freely given gift of God in Christ, upon his union with Christ, which is sheer gift. What Paul points to is the same dynamic then as John the Baptist. He must increase, I must decrease. This is what it is to self-identify fully with Christ. The second thing that Paul brings to our attention is uh, he shows us how we identify not with our own interests, that default mode, but with Christ's interests. And he, he shows us that in verses 10 through 11. Paul writes, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. If you're like me, this sounds very forbidding. <laughs> it makes Paul seem at best, at best, if not a masochist, if not a religious fanatic, um, an uber-Christian, we'll say. And no doubt he was. But to be able to say this and mean it um, appears to be on our capabilities, or at least mine. Um, uh, it's hard to gravitate toward, toward this. 
aspiration that he expresses here. Um, but Paul is speaking personally. He's attesting to his own experience, uh, yet he is presenting himself and what he's learned as a model for us. So what's the inner logic of this passage? How can we find a way to connect with what seems remote and, um, and frankly scary, the kind of thing that would cause me to stop in my tracks rather than keep moving forward? Here I think that um, Bernard of Clairvaux helps us understand the inside story, what's going on in Paul's life with Christ, his relationship with Christ, the dynamics that enable Paul to say this and mean it and live it. Um, Bernard suggests that our motivation for pursuing God, the spiritual journey that's at the heart of the life journey, can be understood in terms of four degrees of love. Um, there are four degrees of love, and so I'm going to briefly describe each one. They're not, um, some of them are not, they're a little different from Bernard's illustrations, but um, they capture the same point. The first degree of love, the first stage, is love of self for self's sake. In this view, I am first and foremost, the world is meant to revolve around me. Um, it's, it's basically the, the perspective of an infant, and it's wholly appropriate for infants, right? Uh, uh, it's appropriate for infants. I cry, and I learn that others will drop whatever they're doing and come rushing to my side and uh, bring relief in whatever form I require at the moment. But beyond that, the infantile stage, uh, it's ugly. We're not meant to stay in that stage. And we have to be trained, we have to be weaned to not always get our way, um, to not always uh, be able to get what we want when we want it. We have to learn how to not throw tantrums when we're blocked, when our preferences aren't met. So we all, the, the point is we all begin at, uh, life at this stage, love of self for self's sake. The second degree of love, Bernard says, is love of God for self's sake. This is when we first uh, come to encounter and to receive um, Christ or God. Um, but this stage is love of God for, God, for self's sake. This is, um, to rephrase what Bernard says, a mercenary love. Uh, it's love still for personal profit. Uh, we, it, we take an instrumentalist approach. Maybe we do a slight cost-benefit analysis. Um, our relating to God is motivated by the rewards incentives and benefits we expect and want to receive, and that he in fact promises us, right? Um, it is still at this stage a love that desires and seeks the gifts more than the giver. Uh, I'm in this relationship primarily for myself, for what I can gain out of it. Uh, God and I have entered into an agreement. I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain, and I expect God to do the same. Um, a mercenary love. The third stage uh, the third level, um, the third degree, Bernard says, is love of God for God's sake. And here we can think in terms of um, the knowledgeable and mature love and appreciation that ma mature, maturing adult children can have in healthy relationships with their parents. Um, understanding, learning how to understand and appreciate a parent as a unique person in her, his or her own right, um, including Knowing, knowing something about, about them as a person, not just as a, a parent and, and uh, in that particular role, knowing his or her sorrows and joys, something about uh, their life journey, reasons for some of the key choices that they made along the way. Um, the point is, in, the, in this stage, um, the adult daughter or son desires to give as well as to receive, to minister, uh, to bless. Um, it's no longer just about primarily or primarily about me. This is the third stage, love of God for God's sake. And then the fourth stage, according to Bernard, is love of self for God's sake. And that might seem a little counterintuitive. We won't spend a lot of time on this. But basically, um, in this stage, um, we, um, our love has been purified. Um, um, and so, in fact, we, ha we come to uh, love ourself in all simplicity as, we, as Christ loves us. Uh, we love ourselves not in any inordinate way, um, but we, uh, we receive and uh, value ourselves as Christ values ourselves and as, as we value all, all other people. So um, what this would look like, this fourth stage I'm inferring, is that we would no longer secretly harbor 
hankerings uh, for um, uh, to be uh, important, self-important. We would no longer have a tendency toward grandiosity. We would have no illusions about our fallibility and fallenness, our frailty. Um, but rather, we would carry within ourselves a constant awareness of the gift of being one with God and spirit, um, especially a deep-seated meekness before the mercy of God, a wonder at the magnitude of God's mercy and generosity toward all of his creatures, of which I am one. So when Paul writes, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead, it is out of love for, a love of Christ for Christ's sake, and possibly also love of self uh, for Christ's sake. Uh, Paul is in prison, and he knows he's going to stand trial where he may be put to death. Uh, he prays for the, and he asks the Philippians to pray for him, for the courage to bear witness. This might be his last and greatest opportunity to testify to Christ publicly, to proclaim the gospel. He himself would rather, he says, prefer to depart, a euphemism for death. He would prefer to depart and be with Christ, but he is willing to remain to build up the Philippians in their faith. But he wrestles in prayer and he suffers anguish daily on behalf of the churches. Paul is willing to relinquish all things and entrust his life and death and resurrection to Christ's faithful disposal. All of these things show what it is. Uh, what it is. Um, all of these things show what it is um, to uh, identify with Christ, to make Christ's uh, joys and sufferings his own. Madeline Langell tells tells a story um, about a Hasidic rabbi who's renowned for his piety. Um, the rabbi was unexpectedly confronted one day by one of his devoted youthful disciples. In a burst of feeling, the young disciple exclaimed, My master, I love you. The ancient teacher looked up from his books and asked his fervent disciple, Do you know what hurts me, son? The young man was puzzled. Composing himself, he stuttered, I, I don't understand your question, rabbi. I'm trying to tell you how much you mean to me, and you confuse me with irrelevant questions. My question is neither confusing nor irrelevant, rejoined the rabbi. For if you do not know what hurts me, how can you truly love me? We know about the reality of union with Christ. Uh, that means that Christ is united to each and every believer. He is in solidarity with every believer. And so, as Paul learned himself on the Damascus Road, um, Christ said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When it was the believers that Saul was rounding up and uh, taking to prison and that sort of thing. Um, Saul, uh, Paul continues to express awareness of the solidarity of Christ and the union of Christ with, with his people in various other places in his writings when he, when he speaks about um, he is willing to, uh, to suffer and to fill up in his body the sufferings of Christ um, that remain to be done. Um, this is because he has so identified himself with Christ, with Christ's joys and Christ's sufferings. Um, I think, as I think about it further, uh, I think really what Paul is saying when he says, I want to um, know participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Uh, I think Paul is saying, uh, in, in other words, uh, he wants to stand by Christ in his trials in the world, and he is willing, uh, just as he knows that Christ stands by him in his trials, in his adversity, uh, through to the end. So this is a, this is a, um, a full identification um, of Christ with Paul and Paul with Christ in turn. What would taking a similar attitude entail for us? How do we move from being united to Christ but still looking out for our own interests? At least if you find yourself even partway in, in stage two, love of God for self's sake. Um, some, perhaps you're like me. I, I think there are times that I'm, I have at least a foot there and hopefully a, a, a foot in love of God for God's sake as well. But what would it look like for us uh, um, to move toward that kind of clarity and simplicity of a Christ-centered self-understanding that Paul models as the essence of identifying with Christ? He wants to be Christ's. 
I want to suggest a pair of concepts from the, con from the literature of spiritual theology. They're heuristic devices, heuristic meaning that we can employ them provisionally to explore and discover, here is go, what they might yield. In the dominant value system of US society, persons are largely defined not in this ancient Mediterranean way, dyadic identity, but not by relationships, but by achieved identity, especially occupational identity, our work. In contrast to more communally oriented cultures, including uh, those of the biblical world, the attributes our society deems as most valuable and evaluates and rewards people for are position, power, prestige, possessions, popularity, and prowess in public performance. This orientation tends to produce and reinforce an identity underpinned by the belief that my value depends on what I have, what I do, and what other people think of me. However, it's precisely this belief that my value depends on what I have, what I do, and what other people think of me that is considered problematic in the purview of spiritual theology. Basil Pennington, among other writers, describes the identity that results when I believe that uh, as a false self. This false self is an idealized persona. It's a stage mask that we wear as we move about in the world. It's made up of what most people want from you and reward you for and what you choose to identify with. David Benner writes that the false self wraps itself in experiences of power, pleasure, and honor. And New Testament scholar Robert Mulholland nuances this distinction even further by relating it to the church. Our false self and its world, even our religious false self, hallow, position, power, prestige, possessions, popularity, and performance. Identity, meaning, value, and purpose are found in these. David Benner suggests, stop for a moment and think about how you introduce yourself. It will tell you a lot about how you want others to see you. Whenever I invite people to see me in terms of what I have or do, I'm living out of my false self. Uh, how and why do we develop a false self? We don't intentionally do so, but we inevitably do so, living in a fallen world. And briefly, I'm going to tell you how mine developed. Um, my parents bought a piano uh, when I was five years old and soon after um, I began to take lessons and enjoyed it very much. And one evening, uh, it, was, it was already dark, my, my father sat down at the piano with me and he was painstakingly pointing out note by note, key by key, you know, which key I was supposed to press. And like a typical five-year-old, I was, you know, um, I was antsy, I was, uh, you know, not really cooperating, that kind of thing. And, and so in a moment of momentary just, you know, just being overwhelmed by frustration, uh, he, just, he picked me up off the piano bench, um, swept me, took me to the front door, opened the front door, put me out on the front step, locked the door behind me, no porch light on, right? Um, at, my father um, was a very loving father. He, um, yeah, we were very close. He would be crushed, actually, if he knew the effect that, that, that it had on me. Uh, in that moment, uh, in that moment, I went from being a totally carefree child loving playing the piano, being playful, enjoying it, all of that kind of thing, to suddenly being terrified and feeling like I thought I belonged. I could be pushed out in an instant. I could no longer be wanted if I don't please and perform and satisfy whoever's in charge, even my, even my father and, and even my family and that kind of thing. That left a deep impression me, on me as a, as a young child. I have to say, I, I still remember that. Uh, incident to, to, uh, to this day, and I know that it transferred over not only from piano to academics and that sort of thing. So actually, the thing about a false self is that it is a mask. Uh, we use it to cover up the wounded, the vulnerable, and the, un parts, the unpresentable parts of ourselves, the parts that we don't feel um, are, would be accepted or welcomed and that sort of thing. So it's very poignant because what happens with a false self is we project that onto God, and we assume that he relates to us in the same way. Whereas actually what Paul's been saying that our identity in Christ is completely based on grace, completely based on grace. Um, not just our justification and pardon, but our, our entire identity. Uh, he has already fully embraced us. Um, there is no fear in love. So I invite you to, um, if you find these concepts uh, evocative or helpful at all, to continue to ponder what are, the, what, what are the particular events that have shaped you, that have made you compulsive, fearful, and driven? Because I want to say I'm so thankful for the work of transformation in my own life, um, difficult and, and painful as it's been. 
Uh, it's possible to be passionate, uh, but not driven. Um, it's possible to love God passionately and uh, work energetically, but not to be driven. It's not about proving ourselves to God or to anyone else. And to the extent that, that you find even remnants of, of that in yourself, uh, there, that is stuff to take to prayer. Um, what, what I want to point out is that, uh, lastly, that um, our, our true self, our false self, is constructed on these secondary materials which end up becoming idols to us. Our true self is our beloved of God in Christ identity. That is an identity. Um, your true self is everything good and true and beautiful about you um, that is congruent with Christ, that God had in mind he intended from eternity in creating you. Um, your true self has been re is being redeemed. It is now largely hidden with Christ in God, uh, but it's going to uh, be revealed in its fullness, in all, all of its beauty and glory when Christ returns. So our, uh, it's very crucial that we begin to uh, be able to distinguish uh, when we're living out of a false self for whatever reasons. Usually it's to cover up feelings of inadequacy and wounding and that kind of thing. Um, the thing is that a fault, living out of a false self is, requires a lot of effort and willfulness. Ultimately, it's a recipe for exhaustion and burnout. Uh, we're, the voices that we're listening to, the, the, the naysayers, the, those that we think we have to prove ourselves to, that's not the voice of God. Um, God calls us um, beloved, his beloved. You're beloved in Christ. You are God's beloved son, God's beloved daughter in Christ. And it's in spiritual formation. Unfortunately, we don't have the time this morning. But it's in spiritual formation, and particularly in solitude, that the false self comes out in all of its, um, all of its force. And uh, that's where Henry Nouwen says it's in solitude. Solitude is the furnace of transformation, uh, where the old self... Um, screams and kicks, uh, dies, it, uh, it is, and the new self is nurtured and nourished uh, through hearing God's word, hearing God's truth, taking in God's love. So solitude uh, is the, actually the furnace of transformation. Um, that's the way that we, that's the only way that we can move from being mostly loving God uh, for self's sake and um, still mostly being about our own interests, moving more and more to completely identifying with Christ in love. Okay. So the goal, finally, Paul says twice, the, the goal of this identification uh, with, with Christ in love is our goal is not so much, um, it's not our work, our task. He says our goal is uh, to be with and to become like Christ. It is union and communion with Christ. It's interesting, he says, this one thing I do, one thing should resonate with Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask, one thing I seek, uh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Also, uh, with Luke 10, um, many things, uh, uh, he, where Jesus says to, to Martha, only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the better part, and it won't be taken away from her. So, I am just as uh, prone to get caught up in work and that sort of thing and to become very task-oriented and that sort of thing. But Paul is saying, actually, we need to, we probably need to um, recalculate. We may need to re recalibrate today, re push the reset button on the GPS. Um, the, the goal is not um, uh, ministry accomplishments per se. The goal is uh, intimacy uh, and conformity with Christ out of which uh, ministry will flow and fruit will last.